just a lot of like maybe a slight polite question and some words of affirmation so like you should not be afraid of this right just come and talk to us about it we want to get you through so I am going to turn it over to our first committee committee intro uh, Laurel Babcock of the Plant Cell Committee this is a hardcore like powerhouse committee for us um, they get a lot done and they raise all the funds for our program so uh, yeah they do a lot <laughs> We do do a lot, which is why we didn't have a fall plant sale this year, because we were burned out. Oh, um, girl, if you stay behind the table, you can take your mask off. Look, you can take your mask off where you are. Where do you want? Oh, OK. You're good. Do you want me to stay here, right here? Yeah, just. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat the walk around. <laughs> Y'all, this is a lot. OK, I am Laurel Babcock. And I am the co-chair of the plant sale committee. Um, my what other committee? I'm sorry? What committee? The plant sale committee. Plant, gotcha. Yep. We sell plants. Um, and my co my other co-chair, her name is Lissa, and she's on vacation somewhere right now. So um, <laughs> we the plant sale committee basically raises, like she said, all the funds for the Durham Extension Master Gardeners, and it's all basically through plant sales. Um, we typically have a spring plant sale and a fall plant sale, but as I was saying before, the fall plant sale for this year just didn't happen. Um, I think we just had a lot of burnout, um, which is a great thing because we worked really hard and did a great job. Um, so we provide educational opportunities for the EMGVs to the public um, and to y'all um, and volunteer opportunities for all of you. Um, historically, the plant sale committee has been having their plant sale at Duke Gardens. I don't know if any of you ever went to that plant sale. Um, we were a big presence there. Um, but because of the pandemic in 2020, we obviously they didn't have the plant sale there so we had to modify things pretty quickly so we developed a website where we could hold our online sales um, and we're realizing that having things online is definitely the way of the future um, for us here with the plant sale um, we yeah we created the website sorry i just need to catch up with myself um, it's used as a resource. So if you want to look at the plant sale website, it is, who's ready? Anybody ready? Yes. Awesome. It is www.backyardtreasuresplantsale, that's a lot, backyardtreasuresplantsale.org. Anybody need it? There we are. There you go. So we created that just like, uh, Lisa and I created that just kind of was like and here we go <laughs> we listed all of the plants that we have for sale detailed information about each of them so you can learn from them the prices of each one the pot sizes for each one so it was a is a huge undertaking but it went well um, this past year we expanded the online plant sale and um, 
we did it for the whole public before the plant sale in 2020 was um, just for friends and family because of the pandemic we were like we don't know if we can extend this to the public it was such a huge undertaking so we started with friends and family of the master gardeners and then this past year we did it for the public um, and it was a huge success um, so that's awesome um, in 2022 we're not sure how we're gonna do it yet probably we're gonna have a live sale we're gonna need lots of volunteers to help with having a sale probably here in this parking lot again um, and we're just gonna need a lot of help and people are there to walk you through what you need to do and everything, so. Um, do you have the date and the next I definitely don't. Okay. No. <laughs> we are not there. <laughs> uh, we're having a plant sale meeting sometime soon. Um, so we'll figure it out, but it's it takes a lot of coordination um, to figure it out. So we have eight members on the plant sale committee um, two of us are co-chairs, like I said. Um, there are volunteer opportunities to dig plants. Basically, we get a lot of our plants from master gardeners, gardens, who need to divide or relocate or something. And so we either go to that house, which is called a pop-up potting party, pup, P-P-P, -P -P, um, or we have a a regular potting party which is held here where people bring in their divisions master gardeners and others bring in their divisions of their plants and then we pot them up and keep them until the sale and then we sell them so all of those things are great volunteer opportunities um, <clears throat> there's also an opportunity to care for potted plants what's once, once those pots those plants have been potted up um, we need people to water and to keep the babies with them in their homes until the plant sale happens. So that can come for volunteer hours, watering, call, you know, calling, making sure that they look okay, all that's ours. Um, we can, you can work in a potting party, which I've already mentioned, and at the pop-up potting party. Um, we need assistance with marketing. We would love to have people helping get the word out to people about the sale um, this coming year. Um, we also need help transporting plants from where they're being babysat to the actual sale itself. So we'll need help with transportation if you have a truck or a, any type of vehicle really um, would be great. Um, and then working the day of the sale, um, which is gonna be a lot of you know, educating people, this is what this plant is. They're gonna ask you a lot of questions and stuff, kind of like um, ask a master, master gardener uh, things. Um, but then also it's just setting up, like making sure all of the, I don't know, shade plants go here or all of the native plants go here or something like that. But it's just a lot of logistics. But it's a ton of fun. There's always snacks. Sometimes there's wine didn't say that um, and yeah it's just it's just great and then there's also the propagation committee is she going to be talking or should I the propagation committee basically just prop, propagates plants and then they sell them at the sale um, so there's an opportunity for that as well um, just to give you an idea in 2018 we sold uh, four and a half thousand dollars 2019 it doubled to ten thousand dollars in 2020, nothing really happened, so we got $6,000, which is still pretty good for a, like a, what are we gonna do sale? And this past year, it was $11,000. So that's pretty amazing. Um, we just keep thinking that the sales are gonna increase because prices do need to increase. So, um, and we have plants for cheap, 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 very, a ton cheaper than, than any other place. But, um, we also have an opportunity this Saturday, if you're able, if you're willing and you have time, in Cary, there is a pop-up potting party happening. Um, one of, um, somebody that I know, she needs all of her plants taken out and they're native plants, but we just need to put them, put new native plants in because it's the wrong plant for the wrong place. So, uh, if anybody's interested in digging up plants on Saturday from nine to 11 in Cary, um, it's on the volunteer sign up thing and you can get hours for that. Uh, we would love to have your help. So, 
Any questions? That was really quick. Yes, Trisha. Um, so if we, I'm doing some moving around at the moment and maybe digging up some stuff, should I pot stuff up that, and sort of just start to babysit that when you call this? Is that kind of Absolutely. A, yes, know, that's okay. wonderful. So just pot it up. It needs to be in a pot that doesn't have any lettering on it, if possible. Any what? Any lettering. Okay. Um, just because we don't want to be advertising Monrovia or whatever. Okay. Um, just a plain pot if you have it. Um, we also have pots upstairs that you can get if you need some. There's also potting soil if you need to grab a, a load or something if you have a lot. Um, but yeah, if you're able to babysit those pots and then plants and then just kind of overwinter them, it's fun to watch them all come up in the spring after you've been babysitting plants all winter. So yeah, that's really how that counts as ours. All the digging, the watching, all of it. Yes? Uh, what is the criteria that you use to determine the sale price of the plants? So we've been doing, um, it's by pot size, which that's going to change a bit, but um, we have been doing it where like if it's six inches across the top, like a, a gallon pot is six inches across the top, that's six dollars or six ninety nine something you know around there a four inch pot is four dollars um and and they're up it gets a little bit tricky when it's a bigger plant like a bigger pot um but we just adjust things but this that's how we've done it in the past this year we have an idea that it will probably be, be whoever's plant it is or whoever is babysitting that plant will tell us what they think it's worth so if you have like a japanese maple and you've potted it up into a gallon and it's a nice it's a nice structure that's not six dollars you know <laughs> that's something that you've been <laughs> so you know we're gonna have i think in the future it's just going to be kind of up to that person to decide and maybe you get a great deal maybe that person says i'm willing to sell it for six dollars and you're like all right so i think it's gonna it's, it's in flux but that's generally how we've done it in the past that helps Anything else? Laurel? Yes, ma'am. I want to talk about the seed starters if I could. Please. Okay, so I'm part of the uh, plant sale and I started on So when I was new to Nest Garden, I helped at the plant sale I loved and I'm kind of a veggie person. And so I noticed how everybody would just bring some, some vegetables that they started at home and their favorites, but we really didn't have any control over how many of each plant, were we hitting what people wanted to buy. So I started with the, with the plant sale committee, the seed starters. So we have a more controlled inventory of vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, herbs, eggplant. In, in, you know, in the fall, we can do our early spring, we can do lettuces and kale but it changes a bit and so i work with that group so if we were, i know we're going to lose a person this year so if anybody has experience or wants to work with us on starting veggies we provide the pots and the soil and the seeds and the lights and help if you need help but we're looking for probably one or two people maybe maybe more it depends so that's just another option that you can um, assist the plant sale. Because we, we um, the veggies bring in a good amount of money. They really, they're really sought after. The hot peppers are always looked for by, by people. So that's always another option. Yes. Yes. I have uh, a flower and crab apple tree. There's nothing that make babies and they plant up the babies and they wonderful growth. But I have like six baby trees. I could easily dig up sticking up. Do you do trees as well? We do we do, do trees. I don't know about the crab apple in particular. Um, we try not to include plants or trees, and I, I have no idea if this tree is invasive or not. Like, I don't know. I know nothing about this tree. If it's native, I have no idea. Um, so yes, we definitely take trees. That's the short answer. 
the longer answer to that is if you have a whole bunch of ligustrums that have just reseeded, we don't want those. They're invasive. We, if you have ivy, you know, we don't want that. So be smart with your choices for what you're potting up. We are trying to focus more on natives. Um, we don't, ex we're definitely not exclusive to natives, but if there's something that um, you said does reseed readily and maybe would take over other native plants, that's where we have to kind of draw the line. So do your research um, and then if you have any questions, contact me, contact Alyssa, and we'll tell you if it's a desirable plant. Um, yeah. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But Joanne is our next person. She's here for the demo garden. Hey, Joanne! Woo! <laughs> so you just said. It's your period. You are, this it. is my first non Zoom in person presentation. I have been doing a lot of presentations on Zoom, so I'm about a Zoomer these days. Even some ladies, we call ourselves Zoomettes. <laughs> so, so, um, you said if I stand over there. I if you, you're you're there. good there. You're good there. You can take your mask on. Okay. Don't worry. You're like at the same level. I'm at. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> they mess with me. You, you know I came prepared. I was really excited about coming to talk to you all today. I remember I was I was in the class 2017. So that was a really nice time ago. And I have to admit, what's a little annoying these days is that all I hear is, oh, you should meet the class, they are great. Oh. Ashley, you all are great. Everyone that come in, <laughs> all the teachers say you all are great. I don't remember them telling us in 2017. <laughs> if I was there, I would have told you you were great. Huh? If I was there, I would have told you you were great. I think you're great. Okay. <laughs> The class last the year before, the class before you all, 2019, I thought they saw they were the greatest ever. And now you all are the greatest ever. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to um, actually speak to you. So I know how it is to come in early in the morning and be here. But I wanted to um, first welcome you and congratulate you for applying and being accepted in the um, Master Gardeners program. That's a big accomplishment. I, uh, when I retired from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics after for almost 30 years, I took all those classes and the test. I know I'm nerdy, but I enjoy every bit of it, so I know you all are having, because I've talked to some of you, and you are enjoying the excellent speakers that's coming in, and the teachers that's great, and Ashley. So I'll move on, because I don't want you all to have any doubt that I would come in this early in the morning if I wasn't recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recruiting on behalf of the demonstration garden. Now, Lauren is gone, but I have to give a big shout out for them because the funds that we spend for the demonstration garden come from the plant sale. And we just got about, what, Eight thousand more dollars. So we're talking about that they're really supporting us. I'll tell you more about that. But I had to, and I really didn't know all of the kind of the history in 2017. So please read on internet in our, our, our own Durham and the state internet because it will actually tell you a lot about the history. Because even with the whole master gardening program that started, what was it? They had. 1972, where some people at Washington State and Tacoma, they had received so many new inquiries about uh, horticulture and, and uh, gardening that they actually did in a mall a program where they trained volunteers. And it was so successful, those volunteers would end up called master gardeners. So from that year for the next, I think, uh, it moved on to North Carolina and. 1978, and then it said, but 10 years later, 1982, Durham was one of the five 
first Master Gardeners program. I know you all have been told that, but I was preparing for you all today, and I didn't quite know all of that myself. So I wanted to share that. So we're really happy. And then in 2000, when the Master Gardeners program had really reached most of North Carolina, the demonstration garden that I'm talking to you today about became a big part of the Master Gardeners program. So number one, I'm here to recruit. Number two, I'm not just talking about any demonstration garden. Ashley came in and we've had a lot of extension agents and it really started in 2000 here on Foster Street and we've had many extension agents. And you came in 2019? 2018. Right at that turn, right mm -hmm. there, because it was right during that time that I took over with Gersh as co-chairs of the demonstration garden. And what Ashley added so nicely, because at that time we were maintaining the demonstration garden, and Wanda, has Wanda spoken to you all? She and Jean, they were maintaining it, and then they passed the torch to Gersh and myself. But rather than maintaining and adding little pieces and pieces, it was really a treat when Ashley, the idea of having a dream garden. Now I'm very competitive. So that, gave, so that gave that gave us a really goal, and I really appreciated that. We visited um, demonstration gardens in Chatham County, Pollinate, Chatham Pollinator Garden. We went Alamance. We went to Guilford, uh, of course Duke, and North Carolina uh, uh, Art Museum, Museum of Life and Science. And they had wonderful gardens all through. And we came back from the committee. And the one thing that, the reason I'm telling you this now, we are not maintaining and adding. We cleaning the whole thing out, the entire front. Pay attention to the two, I'm gonna go through that to show you the beds. But the whole goal here, and I need to stay on task because I was prepared. <laughs> <laughs> that I want before we show you the garden, and the reason I said that we are competitive, because now uh, the state, our, uh, with, what was it called, Ashley, with our tomatoes, our international. Search for excellence. Yes, yeah. and we want our international here. Have they told you all about that? No. We kind of mentioned it. We were. Belle that was here, she was a part of the team, international recognition by demonstration garden, master garden program. So we're going to apply. We don't know when. But the demonstration garden is going to win one year. <laughs> so if, all it can do is get better. So I want to say, and but one thing that we want you to know, if I wake you up at 12 o'clock at night, what the vision was, and we sat down, and I wanted to share that because we debated. Do you call that arguing or debating or giving opinions? So, <laughs> for a long time, and it was just felt so good when we all agreed at the end that for our vision, we wanted to, to be number one, unique. Two, we wanted to be widely recognized as a city garden because this is the city, we're downtown. We couldn't come up with other gardens because this is what, we could change things around, but I don't think they'll like that downtown. <laughs> but, so we had to work with what we have. So this is a city garden. And we wanted to be where visitors are welcome and inspired, and we made sure that they inspired by the innovative practices, displays, and programs. So we're going to have all of that out front. That is our demonstration garden. We started all back over. We came in one day. Um, let's see. When was that? Actually, let's see. Put that up there now. And maybe, let me move because I don't want to be too close to. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Give you a minute to kind of think about this. This is the entrance coming off of Foster Street. Okay. These four beds we were just talking about, that's what I was talking about. We've already completed those four beds. They write as you come in the entrance. Hopefully, you may not have come before we started, so you don't have anything to compare to, but it is a major difference 
we we actually came in on uh, <laughs> it was March, just this past March. We've gotten a lot uh, done in such a short period of time. We came in. We actually identified. We already had the graphics of the garden, so we identified those beds, and we brought in, and then we covered it with newspaper and cardboard. We uh, actually brought in truckloads of 2020 soil. We contoured the beds so it'll mitigate uh, the whole lack of erosion and also to help it absorb more water, okay? So we did all that, covered it with mulch, and then came in uh, a week later and planted a whole uh, an array of uh, perennials, plants. We will get, uh, again, Laura didn't say this, but she's outstanding. She let us use her commercial license for, at the nurseries for plants. So we use her discount from her nursery. Therefore, we were able to maximize the amount of money that we received from them selling plants. So we, we, we're trying to really be uh, good practices here. So we had some nice plants and we planted them in. And, uh, and you can see them right now. They are all uh, the colostas. They uh, bloomed all summer. A couple of them are still blooming now. Uh, the La Trish, they were really great for pollinators this summer. And, and uh, the um, Rattlesnake Master. And I know Ashley is tired of me hearing about Rattlesnake Master. How many people know what a Rattlesnake Master is? They're my favorites. They're my favorites. See, I read too preparing for you all that they won. I'm, I love them. <laughs> they won the, and I didn't know until this year, I love them. Uh, 2016 Wildflower of the Year, North Carolina Wildflower of the Year. And, and uh, you have to look. They are all now states, so you can see them standing up in the garden. So, and to save money, they are real expensive. Again, uh, Lisa, that worked with the plant sale also, grew them from seeds. And they look as nice as the ones you will see at Duke and uh, other areas at Catonica Garden and Chapel Hill. They're really nice. So your assignment and takeaway for today, if you ever see me again, and you may not see me again, I'll make sure. my mentees know they're going to see me again, so they have to do this assignment. <laughs> OK? If Look at the garden. Learn at least five plants. And when I see you again, I'm going to say, name those five plants. <laughs> and I'm going to say, that's, my, that's the way for you to look at the garden. Pay attention to the garden. we got a lot of more things to go. For an example, Ashley just gave us the go to start here. This is our shady bed. Over here, we have uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, willow oak, and then here, we this is our crab apple, and we're going to do a spokeswheel design of plants and perennials in those areas there. And over here, we're actually going to start. Uh, and, and don't forget, we're going to take all those hellebores out that you see out there and donate them to the plant sale. So all of that's coming out, ex except, uh, of course, the. Uh, <laughs> crab apple and others, and we have an azalea that we are keeping. But we will also have in that little area here a hidden area with a bench and a trellis. So we will have some shrubs that will kind of water us off from the entrance coming in. So there should be kind of curb appeal, but the first executive director and the first committee here called that. We will be removing all of that area, uh, plants from there, and our second week, now this will be on later, so we've completed that part. We can start that part. I guess we start some of that maybe even this fall coming on up now. And then this is our um, sunny area. And believe it or not, we're going to have uh, vertical plants here. The ones that are here, uh, we're going we're gonna to remove. I didn't know they were called what? Uh, oh, the meatballs? Yes, meatball shrubs. <laughs> Have you all heard those, those shrubs that's out front? So they had said, and we've been wanting them to go a long time, and they found them. 
we can take them up and we're going to plant certain things like a trellis. Our in-house person will design and do a hand-carved um, stained glass trellis for us, um, Deborah Pendleton. So they're going to be on the side. Now, another quiz. What are these two here that you think, what are they? Oh, you can tell I'm a teacher. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been a teacher. What would you think that? What's so pretty when you're coming in, but right before you go into the building? The what? Yeah. The Gabions. Yes, yes. You all haven't seen those pretty planners that's there? They just don't know what they're called. They've seen them. They love them. I don't know. <laughs> How many hands love them? How many hands have seen them? <laughs> oh, if you've seen them, then you've got to love them. We put a lot of work into that and put our river rocks around and designing Peter and Deborah, and they came in and where we will put them. And then we went out and bought our, our annual plants to put in there. Uh -huh. You all so wonderful. This is wonderful class. You all sleep in the morning. I'm an AM, I'm AM person, so I, I have too much energy. But this, this is how everything is looking. I know it's time for us to move on to uh, for your speaker to come in. But seriously, uh, think about volunteering. We, get, we have from um, back in those days in March and coming in cold in January with our masks on and digging up and doing all of this and doing our beds. We sometimes 10, 15, 20 people. At the same time, we're working with a group with actually putting in our irrigation system. So we're continuing. And even in this area right here, we're putting in um, a bird bath so we can be and apply to become a, a certified bird habitat. Then we can educate people coming into our garden. We're going to take, and then I'm going to be quiet for sure, <laughs> starting in our beds now for our name tags. We, like you have at uh, all the other gardens around, we're going to have just our scientific name, our common name, and our, whether or not it's native, now as a subcommittee, that's, that's going to be a big job because we have 150 plants on our Google Sheet of plants, so we're going to have to be careful, make sure they're all named. But the tree here, rather than having a lot of information on the tags, we're going to have a QR code. Then all you can do is need to take your smartphone, tap it, and it goes right into our North Carolina Extension Gardener Toolbox, which is my favorite place to go these days. But you know I'm nervous in the toolbox. But it has, this morning we had 1,500 plants across North Carolina in the toolbox, and it'll find the plants for you. So again, thank you all. Congratulations again. Thank you. I got too comfortable here. Yes, ma'am.
sign up on the calendar? Yeah. You sign up on the calendar. That's right. Yeah. Um, Trisha, I'll get back to you with some answers. We don't have good ones, but I can talk through things that might work. Um, so I'm going to, just real quick, just because she didn't mention it, they are responsible for the brick walkway. So that used to be a crazy scramble path that was actually really hard to get around the building. This team was the one who put in our brick walkway, which is awesome. And uh, we will be doing another brick order in the future, should you feel like you need to be part of the brick walkway. Thank you for Yeah, so. It's beautiful. It's historic. It is awesome. All right, so I, I, I'm not trying to rush you, but I am trying to rush. Um, <laughs> thank you, Joanna. Woo! <laughs> speaker, uh, Paul McKenzie. Paul actually helped us put in the first version of the demo garden. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so there are great pictures of Paul from the early 2000s, like gesturing wildly and lime being applied. I and looked all exactly the stuff. same. He did look basically exactly the same. It's, it all. it's a little bit unnerving. So uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> it is, yeah, well, we'll have to talk about how you accomplished that. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over to Paul, but Paul was our agent a couple agents ago. Um, he's off to greener pastures apparently, but we loved him while he was here in Durham. Some of the rocks out in the garden are even from, from his property. So uh, yeah, take it away. So you didn't get the memo about my entrance music? Oh, I miss it, fog machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll make do without it. Um, Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be with you this morning. Um, I actually said you guys usually take a break at 10. I, I may go for about 30 minutes or so. 10.30. Oh, 10.30 is when your break is. Wait, I don't know when our break is. 10.30. Yeah. Oh, 10.30, okay, perfect, great. Um, so this is the topic for today. I saw on your, your course syllabus that you've already had uh, entomology and plant pathology, so that's good foundational information to, um, uh, to, to start from. Um, you know, when we talk about pesticides, there are strong opinions on the topic, and there are, there's a lot of misinformation on the topic. So I, I think a valid question that you, might, you guys might be asking yourself is, who is this guy, right? Um, so I, I want to give you a little bit of my background. Um, I, I graduated from NC State uh, with an agronomy degree, which is field crops, but I've worked in, in horticulture um, primarily for my extension career starting in 96. Just before my extension career, I worked for three years in the pesticide research industry, which was very, very informative and, and helpful to me in my career, and then um, in my extension career, I've done, uh, for, for my entire extension career, I've done the continuing education training for the professional pesticide applicators, um, and then just all kinds of, you know, your typical plant problem diagnosis and, and making recommendations. So <clears throat> that's a little, just a brief bit about me. Um, but, you know, with, with Stephen Covey in mind, you know, let, let's start with the end in mind. And, and this is what I want to leave you with, is the vast majority of plant problems that I've seen in my career have been entirely avoidable, okay? <laughs> um, and, and so that's one of the messages that I want you to have in your own gardening activities and if you're advising other gardeners is it's not just how do I solve the current problem it's moving forward how do I avoid it in the future um, and when you're trying to solve pest problems uh, you just got to start with an accurate diagnosis <coughs> um, if you've heard if you've heard me speak before, you may have heard this, this story, so bear with me. But I, I, this is literally true story, conversation I had. Somebody called me at the office and I said, I've got this problem with a plant. I went to the store, I bought a product to try to control it. It didn't work. So I went back to the store, I bought a second product, tried it, and it didn't work. 
Went back to the store, tried a third, I mean, he literally tried three products that didn't work to try to solve this problem. And if he had just called me first <laughs> before he went down that path and we had gotten an accurate diagnosis, you know, he was guessing um, and that's just so important. And this was an interesting case, and, and I meant to look back at my records, but uh, this is actually a, a magnolia sample that came in recently, and um, uh, I, I didn't get a physical sample, but I sent these pictures to the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic at NC State. Um, and anybody want to take a, a guess at what this might, what they think it might be? No, well, my, my guess was powdery mildew fungus, right, which is a problem on, on magnolias, but it, the, the diagnosis came back as an insect problem. Um, so um, that was interesting. Um, and I don't remember the specific insect. So. But the, another thing that I want you to come away with is that these are valuable tools. All right. So, but just like any tool, whether it's a hammer or a screwdriver or a chainsaw or a lawnmower, They've got to be used correctly, and they've got to be used safely. And they can be used safely. And um, we're going to kind of break it down, and I've got a little label reading exercise, uh, you know, because it's all there. Everything you need to do to protect yourself, to protect your family, to protect the environment is there on the label. Um, it's there in the instructions. So, But... <laughs> Uh, they should be used sparingly, correctly, and as a last resort. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot about pesticides, y'all, but this is my philosophy. I, I use them very rarely. I actually don't do a lot of gardening, but even if I did do a lot of gardening, um, I use them very rarely. Um, so, and, and I think there's a lot of things that you can do that we'll talk about to minimize when and where you have to use them. All right, so I, I, I like to start here. Um, well, I guess I've already started, but um, <laughs> I always like to ask this question. By a show of hands, how many of you would say that you do not use pesticides, that, that you never use pesticides? How, ma how many of you would, would say that? Let's, let's see how, and I want to count, so hold your hand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten of you do not use pesticides. Okay, now I'm not going to call anybody out, but in the next few slides, I just want you to think in your mind, do you use any weed killers? Because a weed killer is a pesticide. Okay, and, and I'll explain I'll explain that because that's probably throwing some people off. Have you ever used any weed and feed products in your lawn? That's a pesticide. Okay. Have you ever used ant roach spray, hornet spray, uh, wasp spray, you know, anything like that in, in, in your home, in your landscape, anything like that? That's a pesticide. Fire ant killer. And Fire ant. Oh my God, I did use. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever used insecticidal soap? That's a pesticide. Okay. Do you have pets and you have a flea collar or you use frontline or any kind of topical flea treatment or a spray or a flea bath, anything like that? Those are pesticides. <laughs> okay. Have you ever used any of these products? <laughs> oh yeah. For insects, for, you know, for mosquitoes or ticks or chiggers. Those are pesticides, all right? So having gone through all that, now how many of you would say, I never use pesticides? Raise your hand. So we've gone from 10 to zero, <laughs> okay? And, and every now and then I'll get somebody who is truly, they, just, they, they can honestly answer no, never. But m almost, almost all of us do use pesticides. Some of, them, some of us use them more than others. That's fine. 
Some of us use them very rarely, that's fine. But even if you use them rarely, you need to be aware of the fact that yes, I'm using a pesticide and I need to be careful with it. All right, so what is a pesticide? Uh, let's break it down. Um, it's a chemical that controls either by killing, repelling, or preventing pests, including herbicides that kill weeds. So, so this, is a, this is a common misconception. And, and, and even sometimes, you know, professionals will, uh, will slip on this, and, and it's not a big deal. But from a technical, from a legal definition, from a technical definition, pesticide is the broad category, and then there's all these subcategories. Now, some people, when they say pesticide, they're specifically referring to um, insecticides. But I, I would encourage us all to be a little bit more specific when we're, when we're talking about insecticides, specifically to use that term and to use the term pesticide more broadly. Um, okay, so we've established that most of, most of us do in fact use pesticides. Um, all right, true or false, organic gardeners do not use pesticides. Oh. How many of you think that's true? How many of you think it's false? Okay, good, that's great. It is in fact false um, because, um, keep this closer. Um, yes, organic gardeners use pesticides. Uh, they tend to use, they, you know, they use pesticides that have natural ingredients, but some of them are still quite toxic <laughs> um, to humans. Not all of them. Some of them, are, some of them have very low toxicity, and, that, and that's good. Um, uh, but some of them have off-target effects. Just because it's organic doesn't necessarily mean it's safe for pollinators, for example. All right. Um, and they are subject to the same laws, and you need to use the same precautions and, and, and all of that good stuff. Actually, have you got my good set on the video? You're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you guys are on board with that, that's great. It is with the same caution. All right, so <clears throat> we want to talk about the integrated pest management. And integrated just means that we take a holistic approach to pest management. And we, we look at the whole big, big picture. You know, the, the typical caller <laughs> that I've dealt with that has a question for me about plant that's not doing well you know, is they want a quick, easy, simple solution. They want to go to the store, spend $19.95 on a product, spray it on the plant, and be done with that. And that rarely works. <laughs> um, we need to, and, and that's one thing that we need to be communicating um, in, in our interactions with, with the public is and, and trying to promote and take advantage of that teachable moment that we want to promote this integrated holistic approach. I love this quote from Elliot Coleman, father of organic um, gardening. Insects and disease should be seen as indicators or symptoms of stressed, suboptimal plant growth rather than as enemies to be destroyed. The obvious solution is to focus on correcting the growing conditions. Um, so, you know, that's what it's about. It's about choosing the right plants, giving them a good place to grow, doing the soil sampling so you've got good fertility and all that good stuff. All right, so the principles of integrated pest management, and by the way, um, this entire presentation is available online, and I'll give you the link to it. Um, if that helps you, uh, you'll, you'll have access to that. So we start with prevention, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot we can do to prevent pests from ever becoming a problem in the first place. And that's really, you know, kind of the foundation of being holistic. Then we want to monitor, um, and we're going to talk about all these things, identify, diagnose, correct diagnosis, uh, and then assess, kind of assess how much damage is occurring, um, and then decide on our countermeasures. So there's, there's this whole process, and 90% of our effort should be <laughs> focused on 
the prevention and the monitoring, right? Because if we do that, um, we're going to reduce the number of problems we have substantially. All right, so what can we do for pest prevention? Well, one of the most important things that we can do for pest prevention is plant selection. Um, bear with me for a second. So, for example, if you want to grow hybrid tea, and this is not a hybrid tea rose, this is some knockout uh, cultivar. Uh, but if you want to grow hybrid tea roses, you're going to have aphids and white flies and mites and black spot, et cetera. And, and if, if you want your roses to look good and not die in a few years, you, you're going to have to spray. Okay, so that's a given. Uh, so if you don't want to spray, uh, and if, if you want to reduce your risk of pests, then you can plant the knockouts, you can plant daylilies, you can plant cone flowers. Uh, you know, there's a whole suite of things that you can that you can plant um, if, if so so you just have to recognize that trade-off right um, if you want to grow a consistent high quality crop of apples year after year you're going to have to use a spray program all right and, and it's pretty labor-intensive time-consuming um, and that's just how it is, right? Um, you probably, from what I've heard, could grow apples organically, but you're still going to have to spray. Uh, you're still going to have to use pesticides. You'll just have to use organic uh, pesticides. Um, but you can grow blueberries. <laughs> uh, you can probably grow strawberries with with very minimal pest problems. You can you can grow muscadine grapes. I took my master gardener group to the um, demonstration orchard in Alamance County on, on Tuesday we went and I had probably the best grape I have ever had. <laughs> it was a muscadine grape. It was it was about as big as a it was it was almost as big as a 50 cent piece if you remember what those look like. Um, it, the, it, each grape had one or two seeds in it. I, I, I mean, you could eat the flesh, and it, you know, like like some of the some of the cultivars of, of, of muscadines, the, the the skin is kind of you know, but I, 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 it was superb. It was superb, um, and 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 all of us were you know, he was trying to teach us about you know, and, and we were all just. Taking grapes. <laughs> you lost us. We're done. <laughs> Ten minute break for a grape snack. Um, so, and, and you can grow those all day long, you know, and as long as you prune them and maintain some fertility and have a good sturdy trellis, you're, you're going to be great. Leyland cypress, invitation to insect and disease problems. Nellie R. Stevens Holly, bulletproof. Wax myrtle, bulletproof. Uh, so plant selection. <clears throat> turf grass. If you want high quality turf grass, you're probably going to have to do some weed management with, with some conventional pesticide sprays. Um, if you do all of the good cultural practices, like starting with a good, fertile, well-prepared soil, a proper pH, um, yeah, good for fertilizer schedule, irrigation system, uh, correct mowing height, correct mowing height, and correct mowing height, <laughs> then you can really minimize um, what you're going to have to do for weed management, but you're not going to eliminate it. So if you want, if you want high quality turf grass, I, I don't. <laughs> My yard is literally crabgrass um, and some broadleaf weeds, uh, but I can get away with that because you can't see my house from the road, so, um, so that works. Um, tomatoes, you know, that's kind of an invitation to pest problems. You, you can grow tomatoes probably without using a lot of pest management sprays, but um, 
you're going to have to you're probably going to have some quality issues and some crops are going to be better than others so um, but all, all kinds of pest problems you need. tomatoes are an invitation to white flies and aphids and uh, mites and hornworms and fruit worms and stink bugs and uh, southern bacterial will and tomato blight, early blight, labor, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, so, so those are tough. Uh, but, so, so, you know, there, there's other vegetable crops that are probably a little easier um, and, and can still be delicious. But um, certainly you can look at uh, cultivar selection and some of the garden catalogs and, and even just on the seed pack. Um, uh, and maybe even on the plant tag if you're buying transplants. Um, but it's still probably worth on. Does this have a point? Yeah. Okay. So um, some of your better catalogs uh, have you know, really good uh, information about uh, disease resistance of, of the vegetable cultivars. So that's really good information to have, and, and, and it's right here with this, this cucumber cultivar, um, cucumber mosaic virus, um, I don't know what that one stands for, uh, it's surely another virus, powdery mildew. So, so that particular cultivar has good resistance to uh, several, you know, three, three different diseases. So, that, so that's good, so that's a great baseline, that's a great starting point for your vegetable garden is look for disease resistance. Um, <clears throat> using your reference books, if, if you're gonna plant something, I mean, you know, impulse purchasing is, is one of the joys of gardening, right? <laughs> 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 you know, I, 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 I don't want to take that away from you. <laughs> um, but, but especially if you're doing a significant landscaping project where you know, you're gonna be putting in you know, you know, ten shrubs, or you know, a hedgerow, or uh, you know, perennial border, or, or something like that. Do some research up front. There's some great gardening reference books. Uh, if if you if you're not familiar, do, do, do your master gardener volunteers still come to the um, to the office? Some they, they will. It's weird right now, okay. but yeah, we still have office, yeah. and these guys will get trained on it. Okay, so so this book right here is on your shelf somewhere. I'm 100% I'm sure certain Manual of Woody Landscape Plants by Michael Durer. You, you wouldn't sit down and read it cover to cover, but, but just, just flip up or flip up into a random page or, or, or open to a plant that you're interested in or that, or that you have. And, and he's, he's, got a, he's actually very entertaining to read the plant descriptions. Um, but what these do is they tell you, okay, if, if you plant this, here's what you're going to have to deal with. Um, or, you know, this plant has few reported insect and disease problems. Okay, that's, that's a win. That's what I want. And, of course, I'm sure you guys have already started to get familiar with this, the plant toolbox. Uh, this has the same kinds of information in it as, as some of those reference books. Um, and, of course, it's free online. <coughs> um, in fact, just yesterday I got a call from somebody um, about a plant that I'd never heard of before, uh, and I maybe shouldn't admit the name of it because it's probably something really common that our, everybody knows about, but it was the BB tree. Is that something that everybody has heard of? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> um, well, I had never heard of it either, and so the first thing I did was look it up here, and it said few, if any, insect or disease issues. So that told me right, and I looked it up before I called them back, and then I said, well, it's probably not an insect or disease problem, you know, it's probably either overwatering or fertility or, you know, something like that. So, um, so plant selection, great tool for plant selection and finding things that are um, uh, more hardy, more, you know, uh, less touchy, less finicky. Um, have, have you shown them how to do the find a plant deal? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, that's a great tool. As you're playing around with this, click on find a plant, and it lets you uh, narrow, you know, there's 
over 4,000 plants in the database, and then you can select, tick, you know, check boxes to narrow it down trees that get so high that are good for the Piedmont and they're evergreen and they have pretty, you know, you can, you can narrow it down. Um, and, and so that's a great tool. Uh, so growing things that are adapted to our area. <laughs> Um, so bananas, maybe not the best choice. Although, you know, this picture was actually taken at Duke Gardens. So, um, but, you know, if you're expecting, and that's in novelty, um, but if you're expecting, you know, consistent production year after year, uh, you know, you're probably not going to choose um, sweet cherries or table grapes or, uh, you know, certainly oranges or, you know, things like that. So. Uh, selecting things that are appropriate for the area, where you're going to plant it in the landscape, sun, shade, wet, dry, all those kinds of things, and making sure you know where it belongs and give it the environment that, that it needs. This is not the best environment for a tree. Um, that was the, the planting site for that tree. And uh, it's kind of amazing that they lasted as long as they did, but um, yeah. Plant placement, plant installation. This is, I love this picture. I took it. Does anybody recognize that counter <laughs> uh, back in you know oh. where Panna's office is? I think so. Uh, took this picture with um, probably the the, the the digital camera that recorded on a floppy disk, <laughs> and you had to take it out and put it in your uh, disk drive. So, but anyway, uh, this is an actual sample that came into the Durham County Extension office. And it had been in the ground for uh, several months, and there was no root growth out of that root ball, you know, which tells me right away, you know, that's not an insect or disease issue. That is an installation failure issue. So he either had very compacted clay soil, and he, like, he, you know, use precise measurement and, and, you know, dug the hole exactly the same size as the root ball, uh, you know, so you could just barely squeeze it in and they, they couldn't grab, you know, or, or, you know, didn't loosen it up and it filled up, filled up the whole planting hole, filled up with water and drowned it, something like that. So, um, you know, that's not an insect or disease issue, that, that's an insulation issue. And, and that's just crucial. Uh, I think you've got, woody ornamentals coming up in, in your syllabus. So you'll probably see a di diagram similar to this about the proper way to plant a tree or shrub. That's just crucial, absolutely crucial. Uh, I'd say, you know, a good majority, and, and this is just anecdotal, but a, a, a large majority of tree and shrub problems that I see um, can be traced back to installation. And when somebody asks you, you know, why am I having problems with my tree or shrub? The first question I always ask is, when was it planted? Uh, well, I wanna know what species, species it is, but then when was it planted? And certainly if, if you're talking about a tree or shrub that was planted in the last year, installation, is prime suspect, probably number one suspect. If it's planted in the last five years, it's worth a discussion because it can take that long um, uh, for the effects to show up. Okay, and then you know, improper mulching. You'll learn about correct mulching methods. That's not the correct mulching method, and I don't know why. 20 years after we knew this was a bad mulching method that we're still doing it, but uh, you know, we don't pile mulch all the way against the base of the trunk. Um, so, and, and just an example, a uh, plant with some, some dieback on the foliage and more than likely, I don't, this was a long time ago, I don't remember what the conclusion was, but more than likely that was an installation issue or, or a soil preparation issue. Doing a good job of soil preparation uh, is just absolutely crucial. Um, the plant spacing, your vegetable garden, 
Uh, so you've got, um, you know, there's a trade-off there because you want close spacing for uh, weed management, but then it's good to have more air movement for insect and disease management. But uh, make sure you understand the, the mature size of things so they've got room to grow and thrive. And then proper care, fertility. Uh, you know, we, we know how to do these things. I mean, the, there's science about all this, about, you know, when and how much to fertilize and, and how much to irrigate and good soil preparation. Um, all those things. So, so we know how to do those things. They're not, um, you know, we don't have to guess at it. And, and great references available. Good fertility. Uh, you know, we've got the lawn maintenance calendars that tell you exactly when to fertilize. Uh, there's good information on vegetable production, fruit production, about when you need to be fertilizing. <coughs> Even trees and shrubs and flower beds. We've got the references that tell you when and how much, and, and that combined with your soil sampling uh, will help you out. Proper care, so good pruning practices. This is not an example of good pruning practices. Um, this was this is actually downtown Henderson, um, the county where I work. Uh, and you know, they're between a rock and a hard place there. I mean, that was ultimately a plant selection issue uh, because uh, the story I heard was that, um, you know, they, they specified a dwarf crepe myrtle. <laughs> That's not what they got. Um, and of course, it, the planting site is close to the building. It's under a power line. Um, they did even go back and raise the power lines through a, a pretty major street improvement project. Uh, but still, that's just not the right tree there. And, and We've really got no option, but to, or the city has no option, but to kind of butcher that on an annual basis. Um, but don't put yourself in that situation. You know, put it where you can use good pruning practices, and again, things have got room to grow. Good irrigation. <coughs> um, the, the gentleman that um, called me about the BB tree, uh, he was actually growing in a pot. And, and I, I came to the conclusion that he was probably overwatering was the most likely issue that he was having. And uh, he said, well, how often should I water? Which, you get that question. And it's like, well, there's no set schedule. You just need to check. And he said, well, I've got, you know, one of these moisture meters that I can stick, you know, stick in the pot and it gives me a reading. I said, well, I've got one too. It's, it's on the end of my hand. I call it my finger. <laughs> um, and, you know, I trust this a whole lot more than, than a moisture meter. So one thing I really try to emphasize with proper watering is you stick your fingers into the soil to a depth of four to six inches. You, you, you can't check the surface of a pot or a flower bed and know that there's water in the root zone, unless you've got some kind of magical, you know, um, detection abilities in your hands. But um, so you, you got to stick your fingers in this. I, I, I mean, those moisture meters, they probably do work. I've never used one because I've got my fingers. I, I don't know why I would need one, but I guess they're a little more convenient. But stab a trowel, open up a little trench, stick your fingers down there and feel. Um, and, and that's how you know when and how much to water. Having a rain gauge so you can monitor what's going out with irrigation stuff, that, that helps too. And then the, I'm sure you've talked about in plant pathology, keeping the foliage dry as much as possible. So drip irrigation is a good way to go if you can. Crop rotation in your vegetable garden is just absolutely crucial for disease management. So that's a great way to help prevent pests. And have you had the I can't remember, have you had vegetable gardening? Mm -hmm. Will you have vegetable? You, you have. Okay. So you learned about vegetable crop rotation and you learned the vegetable families. Yeah. Ashley's not in your head. Come on, class. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was up there. I don't know what they looked, but it was up there. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, that's something that you either need to bookmark with the manual. If you're a vegetable gardener, you know, you need to book, bookmark that page in the manual. And it, or you need to print it out and put it on a bulletin board or something to refer back to. And you need to keep records 
And um, I mean, that's just absolutely crucial for disease and, and probably some for insect management as well in your vegetable garden. Um, and if you can have a three or four year rotation among the families, that's good. If you can go longer than that, that's even better. You know, the longer rotation you have, the better. Some of the, some of the disease problems can persist in the soil longer than three years. Um, so the longer rotation you have, the better off you are. Again, all those things that you want to try to do to prevent Prevent pests. Attract and conserve beneficials. This is a soldier beetle, which is a predator insect. And so, uh, so attracting, uh, the way we can attract them is having diversity in our landscapes and having you know, all kinds of different species of flowering plants, flowering trees, flowering shrubs, flowering perennials. Uh, that's one way to attract beneficials into our landscape. Um, I, I will say, you know, and, and actually you probably have a better sense of this than I do, but um, I'm not completely sure where the science is on, on the value of attracting beneficials as far as pest management. I know that Dr. Hannah Barak um, at, at NC State in the entomology department has, has done some research in the tobacco cropping system where they plant border rows of flowers next to the, the tobacco field. And they have, they have found uh, beneficials moving kind of near the edges of, of the tobacco field. So, you know, so there is some suggestion. And do you know of any other research about that? I don't know of any other research studies. I think it's, it's typically on this premise that like so much of what's failing is a lack of ecology in the system, and so it's the idea of you add it back. I don't know if explicit tests. Right. That. Yeah. Right. Right. I'll have to look for that though. Yeah. See what I can find. Yeah. Um, so, but but there's other good reasons to have diversity as well. But um, if we can bring those beneficials into our land, attract them, maybe they're going to help us a little bit with pest management. Uh, but also, not only attracting them, but protecting them once they arrive. And <clears throat> one of the most important things you can do as far as pr protecting them is being very, very cautious with your insecticide choice and usage. So, um, when we talk about using pesticides correctly, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, um, well, let me just wait and I'll get to that. But I, so, I, I, you know, mental note, I'm going to come back to this idea of conserving these beneficials. And, and then here's the other problem that we often run into is just this lack of diversity in the landscape. And, you know, not only are we failing to achieve that diverse biology, that diverse ecosystem, um, like Ashley was talking about, We've also put all of our eggs in one basket. You know, I mean, my retirement count is not based on one stock, right? Um, and so, and we can we can take the same idea in our landscape, and um, you know, why can't we have? Uh, and, and there's some good resources on this very topic. You know, why can't we have? Uh, multi-species foundation plantings or mixed shrub borders. You know, if you do want that screen between yourself and a neighbor, there's no rule that says you have to plant 40 or 10 of the same species. Um, you could have diversity. Now, there's a way to do that where it looks like it was a good design and there's a way to do that where it looks haphazard and if I were to do it, it would probably look at haphazard. So, um, but there's a, I'm sure there's a good way to do that, but having, having diversity in our landscape. And that way, you know, if, you, if you've got that um, row of, and you know, where I live, I'm in a rural area, and so people will plant a 200 foot long row 
of Leyland cypress, and then one, and, and then and they grow for for 15 years, and they get 30 feet tall, and then one dies in the middle. You know, and, and you'll never be able to fix that aesthetically. Uh, it's always going to look like there's a gap. Um, so. Sanitation is a crucial part of pest prevention as well, part of the integrated pest management, that whole holistic approach, and, and this can help with both insect and disease management. Um, so this happens to be frog eye leaf spot, which is a rust disease on apples. Um, and so, well, really you just need to use sprays to prevent that in the case of apples. But, you know, if, if these leaves fall, Actually, this is a bad example because this is an alternate host fungi, fungus. But anyway, um, black spot on roses is a better example. So if, if you've got black spot on roses and the leaves fall to the, on the ground, you need to clean that up. Uh, if you've got apples that or peaches that get brown rot and they fall on the, on the ground, you need to clean that up. Um, and, and that helps reduce the, uh, uh, the amount of you know, or reduce the, sor the, the amount of source, infection source that you have in your garden or landscape. Um, uh, so you, you can go a long way with that. Um, here's another example. This is a twig girdler, uh, which is a beetle. Um, I'm not sure which twig girdler this is. Um, there's one on pecans, there's one on hickories, and, and there's others as well. But um, this little beetle, uh, you know, opens up the stem and, and lays its eggs, and then you get a little bit of wind, and, and, and this is like the, the, the last 18 inches of that little branch or limb. I you know, think pencil size or less twigs, and so you, you get a windstorm and those fall off, and you're out in the yard under your hickory tree, and you're like, who the heck climbed up into my tree and clipped the 18 inches off of you know 15 different branches? Because it looks like somebody just used clippers, um, but it's this twig girdler, and so you clean those up because the eggs are in those. Um, you know, branch tips that have fallen on the ground. So that's a good sanitation practice. So just keeping things clean, you know, when you see uh, an aphid infestation starting or a scale infestation starting, you know, just clip that out. Just uh, be very, uh, very attentive to that. All right, what is the name of this piece of equipment? Tiller. That is that's the common common term used. Um, another term that I like to use is weed seed transporting device. <laughs> <laughs> so your tillers, your mowers, even your shovels and your rakes and things like that. If you're not cleaning those, uh, going from one bed to another, you can transport weed seeds. So you know you've been out tilling in your flower bed. And you're like, man, this bed's got this horrible infestation of, you know, nut sed or chickweed, but you've got another bed that's clean. <laughs> um, you better clean off that equipment before you go to that next bed. And that's true, and, and, and not just weed seeds, but uh, fungal spores and fungal propules, you know, I'm maybe insect eggs, I don't know, but, um, so just be mindful of that. That's another part of sanitation. Integrated pest management, holistic approach. Um, all right, next, the next point in this integrated pest management is this. So first we prevent, and then we monitor. So we've done everything we can do to prevent, but then we want to monitor the situation on a regular basis. Um, and I like to suggest uh, that, I, I mean, our gardens are there for us to enjoy, uh, and, but, you know, we all get busy, but, you know, try to spend, uh, you know, 20 minutes a week just walking around your garden 
one day, you know, one, one day for 20 minutes, just walk around your garden and look uh, at, 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 you know, try to cover the whole, all the different beds, and you know, you're, you're looking for little weed seedlings, you're looking for the start of a scale outbreak or the start of an aphid outbreak, you're looking for, you know, this fungal leaf spot, carry a little, you know, grocery stack and your clippers, and, you know, if you see anything suspicious, just pick off the leaf or, or clip off that part of the plant, drop it in your bag. Um, you see some weed seedlings coming up in a bed, pull those out. Um, so just monitoring and keeping track of the situation, because if you can catch things earlier, uh, you know, here we've got a, a scale infestation. Um, y'all, did y'all learn about scale in your mm -hmm. insect class? So, um, I believe if memory serves, this is you on the scale. Is that what that looks like? Okay. Um, so, th this this could have been, you know, eliminated. You know, I mean, now we're at the point where we've either got to really cut that back severely, or we're going to have to use some type of insecticide. But if we had caught it early, it could have just been snipped and we're done with it. Um, uh, this is one of the cabbage worms. And those things are teeny tiny when they start out. And there's, you know, I think there's three different species at least of cabbage worms. And some of them are exactly the same color as the leaf. And, and they're teeny tiny. And they they hang out on the underside of the leaf, right up against the um, the vein, the, the main vein. So they're hard to detect. So when you're out monitoring, whether it's your vegetable garden, your flower beds, your trees, shrubs, etc., you know you need to really be you know you know getting in there, looking you know getting down on your hands and knees and. Um, really inspecting things and, and keeping an eye on things. Um, this is the eggplant lace bug, uh, which is, you know, uh, you, you've probably heard of the azalea lace bug. This is the same, it's not the same species, but uh, closer related insect. Um, and they're not real big. I mean, you know, things like this, they're small. And so, you know, you got to be looking for these things. Um, this sample came in. This was um, that downy mildew on at some cucurbit. Um, don't remember what, but, um, you know, that's something that you've got to catch early. And in fact, with, with some of the diseases, there's even uh, monitoring websites. And, and this is an example with downy mildew. There's actually a, uh, a website that gives you the downy mildew forecast. Um, or, you know, it's, it's headed your way, and it's in the neighboring county, and so you need to kind of keep track of it. Um, and it's targeted to commercial growers, of course, but gardeners can certainly use it. Um, so, you know, this is a common monitoring, scouting. This is a proven technique in an agricultural situation. Uh, it, it saves farmers money because if they can spend, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, there's some labor involved with, from, from an economic standpoint in an agricultural production situation, there's some labor involved, so there's a cost the scouting and monitoring, uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's a proven cost savings from the standpoint of, you know, you crank up the tractor, you're, you're putting wear and tear, you're burning diesel, you're paying for the pesticide spray. So the same kind of principles apply to your garden situation as well. If you can monitor or catch things early, uh, you can potentially save yourself the cost of the spray um, or replacing the plant. Um, or reduce the, uh, you know, instead of spraying four plants, maybe you're only spraying one. So, 
Any questions so far? All right, we're getting close to 10.30. I'll go through this third point maybe, and then we'll take our break. So sound good? Okay. And then identify, and you know, I told you the story about the guy who bought three different products and you know, not bothered to identify. And identification can be tricky. I mean, it can really be tricky. Di diagnosing a plant problem can be very tricky. And um, how do I say this? <laughs> um, so, for example, you know, people go to a garden center and they say, "I've got this problem with this plant." And you know, we've got some great garden centers. I mean. I love garden centers, but you know, they're trying to sell your product. And, and also, like that's the only solution they have for you is selling your product. Um, so I would encourage you to, to try to do that diagnosis before you go to the store um, to buy the buy the product that you think is gonna work. Um, you know, you see this, and you guys probably know what this is already, but um, you know, this is not a foliar issue. This is a root issue. I mean, this is probably root rot. Um, we're right next to a building, so there's lots of runoff from the roof because the gutters never get clean. And that's a plant that's susceptible to, to root rot. And that is a typical symptom. So, you know, you can spray whatever you want on that, but it's not going to help. Um, so we, we've really got to get a good diagnosis on things. Uh, anybody want to take a guess at, at what's going on here? This is a really interesting puzzle that I had to try to solve a few few years back, or a couple a year or so ago. Any guesses? What's going on? I, it's it's some kind of you know woodland tree. I don't remember. It's, I don't remember what it was. What is that, Ashley? <laughs> Might, I don't know. Maybe it's a cherry tree or something. Uh, but it, it was out in the woods. It's you know, some kind of native tree growing out in the woods. Frost. Frost? Oh, somebody nailed it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I really puzzled over this. When the guy called me, he was like, um, he, you know, he had some forested area, and he said, you know, they were making some aerial applications nearby, and, and now I've got all this damage on these trees. Um, and there were multiple different species affected which tells you that it's not a disease problem. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's some exceptions, but for the most part, diseases are, you know, specific to a certain type of plant, uh, you know, like roses. And then dogwoods are gonna have different diseases and that kind of thing. So, so it had to have been environmental or something like that. So. So why is the turf not? Can y'all see turf is dying there? That spot. Any guesses? Shade. Shade. Oh, look at that. Here's here's the whoops. There's the rest of the picture. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we've got a tree here, and we've got all kinds of root competition and shade. I mean, you can actually see kind of some of the roots. Um, yeah, so that's not a disease issue. Uh, you know, so somebody calls you and they said, I I've got this dead spot in my lawn. <laughs> you know, and so you, you really got to ask lots of questions. And, and this is what's tricky is, you know, things can, uh, you see a, a leaf that's turning yellow. I mean, there's a variety, wide variety of possibilities. Nutritional, viral root rot, fungal, too much water. Um, that can cause that leaf to turn yellow. Um, so we got to get a diagnosis. In this case, at least according to Scott Nelson, a uh, Flickr user um, <laughs> that I downloaded this from, uh, this was spider mites. Yeah, so not a disease at all, it's an, an insect issue. Our spider mites are barely visible to the naked eye. Leaf miners too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, leaf miner trail there. Yeah, good catch. Um, so 
uh, when, when you're trying to diagnose something, if you if you know if you're in your own landscape or if somebody brings in a sample, magnification is a really valuable uh, tool to use. Uh, even just a, a 10x, you know, hand lens or, or magnifying glass uh, is it, really helpful. Um, the other thing is if you're dealing with a client and you pull out, you know, a hand lens or, or a magnifier, you look like an expert. You look, you look like a pro. And so they're all impressed. They're, they're, they're going to stand up and they're going to get quiet. They're going to get some time to think and make up, I mean, come up with an answer. No, but, but magnification really can reveal a lot uh, that, that you can't see. You know, spider mites, thrips, um, can give you some good diagnostic features of leaf spots that might help you when you're looking through your reference materials. So, uh, good magnification. All right, now I'll, I'll do this last slide and then we'll take our break. Um, your phone is a great, great tool for plant diagnosis because you can take a picture of something. Uh, have you told them about the plant disease and insect clinic? We've talked about it, but okay. now I'm wondering how much is getting through. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting it. They're, They're getting, getting it. Yeah, they got it. So NC State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic, um, you can send them pictures. You can send them physical samples and they charge you 20 bucks. You can send them pictures through your extension agent for free. But you've got to have a good picture. Right. So if, if you're trying to get, and, and close-up pictures can be really helpful, especially if it's an insect or a leaf spot, uh, something like that. And uh, not all smartphones, but a lot of smartphones uh, have this macro option, which looks like a little flower icon. So when you open up your camera, um, look and see if it has that, that macro option. Um, and, and, and what you want to do is get as close to what you're trying to photograph, like if it's an insect and you really want to get a good uh, close-up picture. Just you know, sometimes with insect ID, it comes down to you know, counting the segments on the legs or the antennae or something like that. Um, so getting a good close-up picture can be really helpful. Um, and so I'm, I'm holding my phone uh, in this picture, uh, like, you know, an inch and a half away from that little crabgrass seedling. And, and so you want to hold it as close as you can where it's still in focus. Um, and, and if you're trying to get a close-up of something that's far away, don't pinch to zoom. Never pinch to zoom. Big no-no. Zoom with your feet. Okay. Walk to the, the, the subject that you're trying to get a close, closer picture. Move your phone closer. Um, that's the way to, to get a good picture. So, uh, but that way, you, you know, sometimes you can get a picture like that, and then you, and then you can pinch to, to look closer to uh, enlarge the image. Once you've got that image recorded, um, you can pinch. And you can also get little lens attachments for your phone. And they're like, uh, I probably got one in my bag. They're like 15 bucks from Amazon. And you can get like 10 to 20x magnification just clipping on a little extra lens on your phone. That could be a really good way to diagnose things. All right, well, we'll stop and take a break. And what time are we reconvening?